Hey, I'm Caleb with You Can Make This Too. Thanks for joining me. Today's a little different, no project. I just wanted to share some tips that I've picked up over the years that I think will help make your time in the shop a little more enjoyable when you get out there. This first one's easy, magnets. If you've been around, you know I love magnets. And you also probably know if you have any machines that machines also often have little accessories and tools that you need to keep everything tuned up and running. Well, I have magnets on all my machines, like my table saw for my blades, my drill press, I keep my drill chuck key at the bandsaw, all the Allen wrenches, and I even have this shop cabinet that mostly uses magnets to keep a lot of tools out of the way. And I'm also working on a new tool wall that, again, I'm going to be using magnets to help hold a lot of my tools. Here's another easy one. Mobile bases or wheels on everything. I've got them on my workbench, got them on my table saw, my bandsaw, my big planer. The only thing I don't have them on is my jointer just because I haven't made a stand for it yet. Or if I just need more room to work on something, then I can easily move my stuff out of the way, have the room I need, and then go back to my normal setup. And pro tip, I even keep my kids' bikes on wheels so I can get them out of the shop when I have to work easy. For anything that doesn't have wheels, I have mobile wheels. Now this one depends a little bit on what kind of budget you have, but buy your consumables in bulk if possible. It saves you tons of money in the long run. The screws I use in common sizes, I buy them by the thousand and it is so much cheaper than what you pay at the big box store for it. So I have several bins with the common sizes I use. Same with sandpaper. I like to get mine from Cleaning Spore. It's a superior product in my opinion to what you buy at the box stores and it's a lot cheaper too. A 50 pack of any grit is normally 15 to 20 dollars compared to paying 10 dollars for 10 sheets. Just saying. Also stuff like glue. I just finished my gallon jug, but normally buy it by a gallon. Then I have small containers, my little glue bots that I fill up. So anything that's a consumable, if you buy it in bulk, it's probably a lot cheaper. Do it with wood too. I recently had an opportunity to get a bunch of walnut way below market value. So I stocked up and have a bunch more outside. Here's what I'm working on that I started with this bench and that store my tools where I use them. Before that I used, I had this idea of grouping like things. So I'd run all my power tools together, my hand tools together, all my screwdrivers together, etc. All my Allen keys together. Then I realized, well, there's some Allen keys that need my bandsaw. I should just keep them there. Or there are certain ones for the uh, bit extenders that I use at my drill press. So instead of digging for Allen keys, I should just go keep those Allen keys at the drill press. Same with the power tools I use the most. My drill driver and brad nailer stay right here at the bench where I use them the most. Right here, I've also got my sander and sandpaper because I normally use them at the bench. Um, my hand tools I don't have good storage for. I'm working on the new hand tool wall so I can keep them near my bench where I'll be using them. Um, but yeah, that's the general idea. So when you figure out tool storage, try to keep your tools where you're gonna use them. And the nice thing about that is then it's more likely when you're done using them, you're gonna put them right away because that home is where you're working as opposed to what used to be my case, running across the shop all the time, like, oh, I need this tool. Well, I don't keep that at the bench, I keep that in the wall or in the miter station, so. And this is the one no one likes to hear, which is have a cleaning flow, but it's important. Uh, personally, I like to clean whenever I finish a project. And if it's a longer term project that's taken a few weeks, then Monday, I like to just come in and clean up Monday morning. It kind of gives me time to get back in the groove, see what I need to do and get my head straight. But whatever works for you, if it's daily or if it's weekly, if you're a weekend warrior, maybe at the beginning or the end of the weekend or before a project, at the end of a project, just find what works for you and then try to stick to it. One I've struggled with for years in my shop is lighting. When I first set up my shop about seven years ago, I picked up some four foot shop lights when I started and that did okay just to get a little bit more light in the shop, but it wasn't enough. So over the years, I accumulated a mismatch of four foot and eight foot T8 and T12 fluorescent units. They did an okay job just getting more light in the shop, but there's a few things I didn't like. They have a warm up time. The bulbs are supposed to last a long time, but I always had issues with them going bad and just having to move them around, they break. So I wanted to switch to LEDs, especially as I got into more camera work, all the different color tones from all the different lights was becoming an issue. So I talked to Sunco and they were nice enough to send me a 10 pack of their fixtures. I didn't want to deal with just bulbs and having to bypass ballast because I had such a mismatch. So just swapping out fixtures was better for me. But for anyone looking to upgrade or starting, I really recommend just investing in LED for a few reasons. One is it's more energy efficient, so you're gonna make your money back in the long term. 
I like that when you hit the switch, they're on full power and they're also brighter. If you just compare the lumen ratings on fluorescence to LEDs, they're normally about the same, but the rating on a fluorescent tube comes from the light that it puts off 360 degrees all the way around the tube. And about half of that has to be reflected down and there's loss from that because your reflection is not 100%. On an LED, it's just a strip that's inside a tube, so the entire lumen rating is being shown down into the working area. So even though the lights I replace in my shop technically are rated at the same amount of lumens as my setup before, my shop is a lot brighter, and I also like that everything's the same, so the color and lights a lot more consistently. I've been showing you a little bit of the process, and I'll try to get some before and afters up for you as well. Whatever kind of shop you run, this is super important. Machinists are all over this, they get it. As woodworkers, we like to neglect it and think that if you buy a good tool, everything's good. That's not the truth. So you have to learn how to set up your main machines, set them up right, and maintain them. Just because you bought it doesn't mean you're gonna get great cuts. And I bet you, if you feel like you're doing everything right and things just aren't coming together the way you think they should, your machines probably need to get calibrated and set up. It's normally not very hard and it's pretty straightforward. What could be involved in machine setup? Well, at your miter saw, you basically wanna make expect your cuts to be square, but if they're gonna be square, then your fence needs to be square to the blade. If the fence isn't square to the blade, then the cut's not gonna be square. And also, you expect a square vertical cut, which means this head, when it's in its 90 degree position, needs to be 90. On a jointer, your beds need to be parallel with the cutter head so that way it's flat and the infeed and outfeed tables, infeed and outfeed, need to be coplanar with each other. Also the fence needs to be square to the infeed table if you expect to get a square edge, which is one of the things you want to get off your jointer. At your table saw, you want your blade to be parallel with your miter slots and with your fence because against your fence, that's important to prevent kickback and also just make sure things are cutting the dimension you think they are. If you're using any type of miter gauge or anything that runs in your tracks, that's important because you might think you're getting a square cross cut, but in reality, you're cutting an angle because these aren't tracking together. The bandsaw, um, I need to set mine up again so it's become a table. I'm not even gonna try. Alex Snodgrass has great videos on this. I'll link them below. If you don't know how to set up a bandsaw, watch that man. He's the expert. A drill press, really? Set it up? Well, yeah, this table's adjustable. You wanna make sure that your table is 90 degrees to the bit that comes down because the idea, or one of the real benefits of a drill press is being able to drill vertical holes. But if your table is all cockeyed, well, guess what? Your hole's not gonna be vertical. In your planer, it's supposed to make things parallel, but that depends on the bed and the blades being parallel to each other. If they're not, then you're gonna make wedges every single time. So you gotta make sure those are parallel. And I hear you. Well, that's great if you know how to set them up. What if you don't? Well, if you look at your machine, you think about what might need to be adjusted and then you look at it, you can probably see if you're fairly mechanically inclined, how those adjustments can be made. If you have a good square, you can make them. Now, if you don't know, uh, a good suggestion is just go to YouTube or Google, search your model number and how to set up or how to adjust, how to calibrate. Someone's probably done a video, I've done several. I've done it on my joiner when I went over setting it up. I recently did one on how to dial in a table saw before, you know, two years ago, I did one on my old DeWalt miter saw. You can probably find them. But even if nobody has done the crayon and construction paper step-by-step -step for you, I can guarantee whatever machine you have, if it's been made in the last 30 years or so, I know how you can find out how to calibrate it. And you're smart people, so you've probably asked yourself by now, if this is so important to do with these things that you buy from people who make them, how come the people who make them don't tell us how to set them up? Well, they do, but because capitalism, uh, they hide it. I don't know why they hide the information, but they hide it. But I'm gonna tell you where to find it. Step one's kind of scary, but I promise you in all my life, and I've you know visited over 20 countries, been to two wars, went to college, got a law degree, been divorced, had some kids, started a business, bought land. I've never needed to show this to anybody. So you just break out your man card and forget about it. Then you go to that box where you dump all those owner's manuals that you forget about, or maybe you've thrown them away. 
If you've thrown them away, you go to Google and you search your model number and owner's manual. And when you look in that thing, there will be a section called maintenance or setup. In there, it'll tell you how to set up your machines every time. And this last one is one that kind of stops me some, um, normally when I don't recognize it. And that's don't let best stop better. Or you might have heard before, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress, whatever. So, for example, I need a battery charging station. My batteries have gotten out of control. I've got so many of them in different brands and I've been trying to figure out how to organize them. And I have chargers hidden everywhere, batteries hidden everywhere. There's no system to it because I've been trying to figure out the right thing to make to store it. And then it just hit me the other day. It's like, Caleb, why don't you just make a shelf and stick them on it so you at least have them in the same place until you can figure out you know, what's ideal. So before you get to ideal, just do some improvement. Now with my shop flow and shop furniture, I'm normally really good about this. If you follow for a while, you know this is like bench number four I've had in here and camera left is bench number five. Uh, I don't have to build a perk and I, I've got bench six already kicking around in my head because I just have an idea and instead of trying to figure out what's perfect, I just go, okay, I know this is the idea I wanna go with moving forward. So let's implement those ideas in something and give it a try. And maybe it's just changing your layout. You know, you don't have to have all the things, just if you have an idea, go for it. Don't worry about it being fully developed or perfect. See if it works before you commit to it. Because I definitely have made that mistake before of thinking, this is what's gonna be perfect. Then you invest all the time and money and you get it all together, then you go, oh, you know, now that I have it, um, there are these things that are now obvious that weren't obvious before I tried this. And it's, uh, well, we need some more changes. Well, just jump into it. That was kind of convoluted, but I hope it made sense. Just don't let best be the enemy of better. If things need to be a little bit better, just do something to make it better. Even if you know it's not the best, you'll figure out best eventually. And really best changes as you change and your shop changes. The projects I do now are different from what I did a year ago, two years ago, definitely seven years ago. And so my needs have changed. So what my shop needs to be to meet those needs have changed. So what was perfect seven years ago, you know, isn't even adequate now. And I'm sure that's going to continue to be true in the next two years, next five years, next 10 years. You know, what I'll need then is probably gonna be really different than what it is I need right now. But anywho, that's uh, eight shop tips that I've kind of figured out in my time having my shop. I hope some of those help you. Please leave me a comment. Let me know what some of your favorite shop tips are or something that you really took away from this that you like. You probably noticed I referenced several future projects, uh, be building a new workbench eventually. But right now I did just upgrade my jointer. I'm working on the tool wall. I've got some other things in the work. So if you're interested in those, do make sure you subscribe so that way you don't miss those. And until next time, make time to make something.